Uh, hello. So I will speak about cyber warfare, and that is quite a timely topic, to my surprise, because w when I was starting to deal with that, it was 2018, it will look like something higher up, like, uh, not really something of re real, real world relevance, but suddenly it's really relevant. So a crash course will make international um, policy uh, low and, of course, technology. It will be based on my um, direct experience, skills, uh, knowledge, and also quite a uh, book, I, I, I write, and who I am. So I'm an independent uh, security and privacy uh, consultant and researcher. Uh, I completed a PhD at the French in RIA. I was the cyber warfare uh, advisor at International Committee of the Red Cross. There is a second advisor here today. I don't see him, but he had a talk this morning. So um, fortunately, you are already acquainted and uh, familiarized with some concepts already, which will be easier for me. So I authored some papers, reports, and also a book, Philosophy of uh, Cybersecurity. Now, Let's separate facts from fiction. Uh, does any one of you have any, any conception of cyber warfare line in your head? Please raise your hand if you have any thoughts about cyber warfare concept. Okay, not much. Uh, so I will explain. So uh, one possibility would be to treat cyber warfare as um, s just a war waged over networks, over internet, targeting digital components, and only reduced to that. Obviously, that would be too simplistic because in reality, typical wars are waged over various domains, such as land, sea, air, uh, space, not really, but also now cyber. So that's the sane way of thinking of cyber warfare. Cyber activities um, made in context of existing armed conflict, of existing war. So cyber warfare activities then in peacetime is quite absurd. Now, Let's introduce a useful concept of using force. Has any one of you heard of using force before? That's an international legal term defined in United Nations Charter, and it simply says that it's prohibited, with exception to some cases. In practice, using force is conducting actions that result in the destruction of objects, or lethal effects, like killings. Which is why also cyber attacks usually almost never attain this level of impact, so they are not attacks. So that's the first major surprise of this talk. Cyber attacks are not attacks. The typical conception of a uh, cyber attack we read about in the news, in the media, or things like that, uh, they speak about cyber attack, but this is just a publicist framing. Pub very useful term, but it holds no meaning when it comes to defense, strategy, and uh, war-related aspects. Actually, what is an attack? Attacks aren't really that much often defined in actual applicable binding rules treaties. Perhaps the most um, famous one is the one defined in Geneva Convention article specifying that, and I am quoting, so acts of violence against ad the adversary uh, still quite ambiguous. It's act of violence conduct, uh, conducted made uh, co versus the adversary. So, so would be, some would be lawful, others not. In general, that will be something uh, made, something offensive made against a uh, destructive, aimed at uh, objects like buildings or people. That would be those acts of violence. So that's for us the surprise. And also, due to the fact that cyber attacks do not attain um, the level of attack, it's there's a t very useful, much useful term 
call it uh, cyber operations. And cyber operations can be uh, defensive, offensive, and also in reconnaissance. So defensive will be cyber security, like network segmentation, isolation, uh, patching, updates, configurations, those things. Typical. Offensive could be breaching remote targets, systems, disrupting them, uh, perhaps destroying them. And that's for that. There are also concepts of cyber norms, which became um, quite r uh, famous lately. Has anyone of you ha ever heard of the concept of cyber norm? Please raise your hand. That's important, if you have. That, so not much. So a cyber norm is um, a concept negotiated in experts, government expert group in United Nations. People from multiple states, multiple countries, they negotiated. There's about a dozen of them. And an example of such a norm is do not attack computer emergency response teams. And this is very sensible because CERTs, for example, need to pay attention so that, for example, hospital networks are uh, usable. So that's quite a sensitive area. But we also have some example practice during the current war in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine, like, for example, when techni network technicians were being coerced to give, physically coerced, to give access, not with a rubber stamp, something much more uh, lethal, probably. And this begs for the questions, do cyber war norms are even relevant? They are non-binding. It is totally optional to adopt them, and it is unclear whether they are being respected during a war. So also United Nations is a structure typically dealing with um, works below the level of armed threshold. So the question is whether cyber norms are even applicable during wartime. We do not know an answer to that. It's seemingly nobody wants to open uh, this kind of worm of worms of discussing this. But there are rules of uh, war. Rules of war are those laws of armed conflict, international humanitarian laws such as Geneva Conventions, for example. You already had an introduction to that this morning. So fortunately, we only may. Uh, can discuss this uh, promptly. For example, critical rule is the rule of distinction. Uh, civilians are protected. Combatants, like soldiers, are those who should fight. Same for buildings. Some are uh, used for military purposes, others for civilian purposes. Those targets should be distinguished, and civilian objects or people should not never be targeted um, directly and intentionally. So civilians should be spared. Uh, cyber tools which could reach highly destructive outcomes should also undergo, uh, undergo a, a legality test with respect to the Geneva Conventions. Although pra the practice during the current war in Ukraine is that uh, sadly civilians are um, victims of many armed activities. Also, civilian systems are target of cyber operations. Not clear whether those are attacks. Actually, none of those public ever attained the level of attack, so it isn't clear whether it's legal to do cyber operations or not. Some say that um, activities against such systems like banking systems or government systems should be re refrained uh, from stopped. Others do not because they argue that, for example, there is no legal uh, requirement to um, forfeit such cyber attacks. And the practice during this war is that such targets are the, are the target of uh, operations. 
So in summary, what is Cyber Warfare? Cyber Warfare would be the application, the use of ICT tools, information communication technologies, and communication technologies to achieve some effects. Obtain access, disrupt a system, disable it, to, so to deliver effects, so call it effects. This can be done in support of information operations, but also land unit activities. However, in Ukraine, we haven't seen, we did not see any events following a cyber operation that resulted in, a, resulted in blowing things up, killing people, or, for example, uh, tampering with uh, weapons systems. And this caught some analysts by surprise. You see, they expected very a lot of high-impact cyber operations, cyber attacks even. Disruptive, like they expected cyber fireworks. And this did not happen, so some of them even concluded that cyber warfare is not the case. And that's not true, because cyber activities still are conducted within the context of armed conflict. So cyber warfare is the case, just cyber, war cyber fireworks are not the case. So there were no cyber pearl harbors or other useful, useless conceptions of the kind. Now, let's even, let's discuss whether it's even possible to deliver lethal effects using cyber operations. Th because there were reports of the kind. For example, uh, the German hospital case in 2020 where um, a ransomware paralyzed one hospital and an ambulance had to be diverted to another and the patient died. But no casual, uh, causal link has been identified between uh, uh, the, 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 the effects of cyber operation and the actual death. Because actually, actually finding causality, establishing causality between a cyber operation, cyber attack, and uh, a lethal effects like death is very, very difficult. So it never happens to date. Some researchers even claim it that cyber attacks like ransomware kill because, uh, and wait for it, because after a cyber attack, um, slightly mortality allegedly increases, and they argue that this is because some medical procedures take more time. But why do they make more time? Because after a cyber attack, typically some cybersecurity solutions are being deployed. So, for example, you need to provide password or something like that. However, it's quite obvious that systems should be protected from entry. And this is an issue more of user interface than a cyber attack in itself. So it's important to design user interfaces that are simple to use. That will be a good, proper conclusion. Now, could theoretically cyber attacks kill? Uh, yes, because for example, one may cause um, disruption at, for example, a steel mill, uh, cause, a, cause a, an explosion, for example, with indirect lethal effects. Another issue uh, would be uh, the hacking of um, medical devices, like implantable pacemakers or objects of the kind, which are frequently used by thousands of people. Uh, for example, pacemakers administer some electrical impulses to stimulate the act activity of the heart. Assuming that the logic of it is modified, it could theoretically co administer out of ordinary electroshocks with uh, potentially lethal effects. This is all in theory. Now, for the cases which are clearly not cyber warfare, is uh, espionage. For example, solar winds. Has any one of you heard of supply chain uh, operation attack SolarWinds? 
which bridged many organizations by a malicious update, so on and so on. Now, it was not cyber warfare, it was for espionage purposes, like many, many other things, like, for example, disruption of a uh, company in Russia, the so-called tro troll factory, which was allegedly made by U.S. cyber um, state cyber groups. Now, those things are more likely espionage and definitely do not attain the level of attack. So they are not cyber warfare in themselves. Now, how about events in Ukraine? And I'm also very gracious to the speaker before me, so I can just focus on some specific aspects. So there are multiple targets, states, uh, critical infrastructure, but really many, many novel events, events that stand out and events that uh, deserve to be discussed quite regularly even. But let's discuss first about things which happened before the land invasion, which was the hacking of plenty of websites. And in planting them on information operation payload. So uh, this was a picture with um, a message in languages Russian, Belarusian, uh, no, Russian, Ukrainian, and also in Polish, which was done machine translated, multiple errors, mistakes. Now, what is the informational payload here? The payload is, uh, the message is mostly like that. Ukrainian, all your data is stolen, it's leaked, fear of the wars, you will have problems, blah, blah, blah. The content is also that you will pay for your crimes committed during Second World War, which played on the resentment between Ukrainian and Polish uh, societies. And this is quite perfidious when you recall that currently Poland is the major hub of military support to Ukrainian. Most military support goes through Poland. There are lots of delivers. Also, Poland hosts more than one million Ukrainian refugees. Now, trying to disrupt something like that with an information operation was quite malicious. It, of course, didn't work, but yeah, you can imagine that this could have happened. And some Western media even caught the bite. So they uh, disseminated this particular content about resentment between Ukraine and Poland. So uh, be careful when you repeat what a cyber operator implanting information operation does. Now, cyber in Russia is a very broad topic, much broader than the time we have, so uh, short summary. They are wipers in use, so data deleting. On the Russian side, we have seen uh, the hacking of Ukrainian government systems, we have seen information operations, and we have seen also internally in Russia changing of regulations to increase the cybersecurity requirements of states, the government structures and companies because, and hear this, they were surprised that they became a victim of uh, hacktivist operations like distributed denial of service, uh, organized hacking uh, campaigns. They were caught by surprise by that. Now, on the Ukrainian side, of course, we have defense. They are under attack, so they defend. They, uh, they try to disrupt operations, uh, the cybersecurity. This is also setting of activist organizations, such as IT Army of Ukraine. This is also um, disclosing identities of some soldiers, Russian soldiers, or operatives or traitors involved in um, the attack. But on the Ukrainian side, we have also seen victims of uh, Russian cyber operations, like, for example, activities which aimed to hack devices, smartphones of soldiers. For example, to steal um, some information, perhaps the location. And it seems that the Russian cyber operator knew what to look for. So they knew the 
for example, the file system organization on the smartphones of, of Ukrainian uh, soldiers. And we have also seen the moving, the quick move of data from government systems of Ukraine. Systems and data to the cloud, outside the country. And tip, the typical cyber warfare is obviously the hacking of um, space-based modems, terminals. It was very loud organization. That was quite typical cyber warfare. You had a disrupted infrastructure, even though these were user terminals. Uh, so someone hacked um, someone. <laughs> Russian cyber operators hacked, uh, at least likely, uh, Russian operators hacked um, the systems of this company and pushed a malicious update which FF'd firmware, so disabled the firmware. And the targets were not only in Ukraine, because the point, uh, the point was that Ukrainian army used the system for communication. But in order to target um, targets in Europe, you had collateral damage, like, for example, uh, users in France, in Germany, in Poland, in other countries. For example, windmills stopped being controllable because they also used the system. So, civilian systems in countries that weren't in war were impacted by cyber warfare operation targeted at Ukraine. This, of course, doesn't mean that it was an armed aggression or attack, a uh, use of force, against those third countries. But for sure, it was with respect with Ukraine. We have also seen something else. How many of you has heard of at least one data breach where sensitive private data has been leaked. Raise your hand, please. Yeah, we are hearing of it quite regularly. However, during war, the situation and the stakes might be different. Some databases are sensitive. For example, the database of gun owners. This may suggest, for example, to land soldiers that such people perhaps will be opposing the occupation. And we have all heard of the uh, um, so-called filtration camp. Interrogations, sometimes brutal. So during war, databases and state registers become particularly sensitive, especially some of them. Every state should consider, them, consider that when building cyber resilience strategy. Of course, Ukrainian uh, side also tried to deflect some operations, disrupt some operations, for example, information operations. So um, they identified sources of distribution of propaganda, information operations. How? Uh, bot firms. Bot firms, they is con con consisting of uh, lots of smartphones and SIM cards, are being installed at, for example, civilian premises with their knowledge and consent, or perhaps not, probably with. Still, it may obscure the source of such an operation, because technically it would have been sent from Ukraine to funnel, uh, to direct uh, propaganda, enemy propaganda. So yes, especially during war, you take this out. That's clear. Another interesting happening, in the very early days, someone used ads to pierce through the Russian censorship and propaganda to display content informing about what is actually happening, that the war is ongoing, explaining why, for example, the credit cards is not working. It was an information campaign. So, uh, how many of you are using ad blockers? Quite a lot. So, perhaps you are not even familiar with how ads 
work. Of course, these are slots, standard slots where an ad is being displayed. Sometimes you visit a website and you have a t targeted ad which says that, for example, advertises, for example, um, the ability to buy shoes. In this particular case, you had an information saying that this is no a special military operation, this is an actual war, things like that. So yes, it was used for actually, from actually, uh, at least our perspective perhaps, uh, quite a positive thing. So um, it would be quite a paradox because people who would use an ad blocker would never see this. And of course, we have also seen or became aware of cyber operations targeting energy stations. Details I spared. Some of the, the such concepts are covered in the previous talk. So nine substations, energy substations were hacked successfully. Access was achieved. Electricity was not disabled because they were disarmed, detected, and that's, that's it. Had this happened successfully, it would surely be used by Russian propaganda to undermine the trust in Ukrainian state. But it did not happen, so it could have been used by the defender propaganda. And that's how it uh, works during a uh, war. We've also seen the use of deep fakes, which, by the way, are quite totally legal with respect to international humanitarian laws, so Geneva Conventions, laws of war. Uh, information operations are legal, including propaganda and so also deep fake uses. This is explicitly written in Geneva Conventions. But appreciate the differences. So almost one year ago, we have seen a pre Ukrainian president deepfake, so Zelensky, which uh, it was a doctorate uh, manufactured content that uh, called Ukrainian soldiers to surrender, blah, blah, blah. It was delivered uh, uh, over quite obscure channels, something like social media, so, also due to that, nobody actually saw it. It was also very quickly take it, taken down. We probably only hear of it because it will eventually, eventually was covered by the media with, of course, flashy titles, deep fakes used in war, first use of deep fakes during war, so on, so on. But the impact was zero. Why the impact was zero? The impact was zero because probably next to nobody actually saw this. Let alone making any action in response to that. Now, this year, uh, there was a Putin deepfake. Putin's deepfake, so Russian president's deepfake. And the situation here differed because the delivery channel was different. Uh, a few Russian televisions were hacked and I read this message. I read this message uh, saying that a uh, military draft is ongoing, which is quite unpopular in Russia at least. Impact is unclear, perhaps low, but the delivery channel is much, much better because it was actual delivery channel, actual channel that is seen by actual people because it's not difficult to create a deep fake today. Anyone can do this. That's not the problem. The problem is to actual, actually reach the audience. That's the problem. Now, I've said that, I say that information operations are okay with respect to laws of armed conflict, which are a different body of laws than the ones we see, um, usually the state ones. They are different. Uh, and the major difference is that there is no court that is actually enforcing or executing it. Um, these are rules that states would preferably abide by themselves, you know, um, just voluntarily. Of course, they are binding, but so is the ability to use propaganda in Geneva Conventions as is the conducting of cyber operations. Uh, and actually, um, 
International Committee of the Road Cross even somewhat said that this is okay. I think that in the previous week there were eight rules for hacktivists, and by the way, hacktivists are unable to conduct impactful operations, typically, the typical conception of health hacktivists. That's the point. It uses this terminology of attack, which as we are by now should already understand, attacks are something effect, some, some operations with destructive effect to objects or perhaps killings. So, um, hacktivists are unable to conduct high impact cyber operations. So that would mean that preparing such eight rules points actually, um, may be used to argue that those things are right. Because ICRC, of course, is using the attack in the very formal sense, not the sense we see during the, the media coverage. Now, the very important thing during wars is beware of information fog. Some things are used to, as propaganda, to disinform, to change narratives. Some information are withheld. This is also why some Plenty of analysts concluded that cyber warfare is not the case because nothing of impact is happening, but cyber operations were being conducted from the very early days of this conflict and by multiple states. That's the point. Just they are not public. The information about them is not public. So drawing conclusions of limited information is quite questionable. This is also what is happening now in Israel. Uh, the reliability of information cannot be, uh, at, I mean, guaranteed. So just the point is to be careful. Now let's discuss some uh, practical matters. How should company, companies react or behave during uh, times of war? First example is simple. How should a company that is not in the war zone, armed conflict zone, should behave? So basically just cybersecurity rules. Perhaps tighter isolations if there is a branch of the company in the zone of armed conflict, so war zone. For example, if someone has a branch, uh, let's say, in Ukraine, uh, just to be sure that if some self-spreading malware is, for, let's say, released for some reason, that it will not reach the actual headquarters systems from the branch. Because the, the, the effect may, the impact may be the indirect. A situation slightly changes for companies in the war zone. Of course, I'm not saying that every company should always be prepared for the um, eventuality of war happening. Because, for example, in Luxembourg uh, or in Belgium or in France, currently the risk of being at war, at least in the foreseeable future, let's say in the next five years, is non-existent. So it's also basic cybersecurity as usual here. But in Ukraine, you do basic cybersecurity, but also full backups, and including those very sensitive information, such as those passwords, which are typically not transferred during the cloud. You, really, you should really be ingenious about that. For example, store it in several places. If not in cloud, then physically somewhere in several places with the ability to move it out quickly. But, but yes, the government uh, sent most, if not all, systems abroad, that which was quite unprecedented because it happened very fast. And this was petabytes of data. Now, what happens if you are in the war zone? Obviously, personal safety, stock up on food, have access to water, some reserves, fuel charged batteries, power banks. So just be prepared for uh, the ability that uh, there will be no um, access to um, uh, the ability to purchase food, uh, charge phone, something like that. 
Oh, fuel also, if you, if you are uh, car-based. That's quite obvious. Another is issue is that, um, not sure if you trust your government, but during the war, you have to have some reference of truth. And the most obvious one is to follow government advice and information. Now, in Ukraine, there is also some specific consequence because uh, the government equipped the official state application used for e-government before the war, equipped with functions to um, report the sightings of enemy soldiers, enemy equipment like drones, missiles, tanks, something like that. But it's quite interesting what happens to the status of the person who uses those apps. Usually people are civilians. Civilians historically weren't engaged in wars. Uh, hundreds of years ago, wars were usually done between soldiers. Well, of course, there were civilian casualties too, but today, during Dean's populated cities, the situation is different, of course. The point is that when a civilian is using such an application to report the sightings of enemy um, military, he or she, uh, at least temporarily, loses their civilian status. They become the so-called unlawful, com unlawful combatant. Because the lawful combatants are those distinguished, so in uniform and so on. When you are an, an unlawful combatant, you lose your protection, you use the potential prisoner of war status, and generally very unpleasant things may happen if, should, should, should you are caught. That, those, this is said by Geneva Conventions also, or at least suggested. So, make sure that you are aware of the stakes, and for the states, it's also prudent to inform their population about the stakes. I mean, it's obvious that civilians want to support, want to support, they desire to support their uh, states, to defend it. It's usually always happened this way, Some, uh, sometimes with consequences. But the point is that, the fact, the fact is that the mere use of a smartphone, turning a civilian into an element of an anti-aircraft node, is pretty unprecedented. This never happened. This will surely impact on future negotiations about uh, some stabilities, about some rulers during uh, war. And we have no idea in which direction that will uh, go, of course. Now, has any one of you ever hacked a system? I will never, I will not tell anyone. Just raise your hand. Okay, probably much more, but I, I admire, I, I admire that at, at least one person raised hand. So, um, hacking outside armed conflict is usually, um, regulated with domestic laws. But let's assume that you are a hacktivist or you want to get involved medal in an armed conflict. You are a civilian, of course. You are based at least now in Luxembourg. So logically reasoning, you are uh, conduct, uh, committing an offense because, the, because uh, hacking is usually prohibited these days. It's being prosecuted. But... The uh, fact of the matter is that it will be quite awkward for a Western government to prosecute such activity, like, for example, hacktivism in the Ukrainian and war, uh, uh, Ukrainian and Rus uh, war with Russia. I mean, Russian war in, in Ukraine. Uh, it will be it will be politically untenable to probably prosecute such people. It will be very politically inconvenient. But the point changes when you are in the war zone, because then you again become an unlawful, combat, uh, an unlawful combatant. You meddle in the war, and some people were caught, and they are being prosecuted. 
Not sure what happens to them, but that's probably um, a very risky thing to do. Because meddling in such activities is really uh, risky and really uh, tricky. It probably cannot be stopped because the genie is out of the bottle and it's, it will be weird for an international organization to demand uh, the reversing of this um, trend because uh, the genie cannot be put back in the bottle. I mean, would you, you would have to expect Ukraine prohibiting their civilians during that. And that wouldn't look very well for such a government, at least during war. So this is a very tr tricky territory and time for those uh, who um, literally try to stick to the uh, rules of armed conflict. And they can be applied to cyber warfare, and I proved during this talk that it can, they can be applied very concretely to armed conflict, not ambiguously. But the talk comes to an end, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, as a summary, I would like to just recall that cyber war in Ukraine holds there a lot of precedents, also technical ones, but uh, for example, engaging of uh, space-based internet connectivity and breaking uh, modems. So that's the important thing. But another important takeaway is that we have ongoing negotiations to limit the um, disruptive cyber uh, operations between states there are, those are negotiations between countries and also instructions like United Nations. What is happening now in context of Russian war in Ukraine, uh, quite this could impact such negotiations quite uh, badly. It's difficult to predict, but some rules which were developed prior to the war clearly went out of the window. So going back to the negotiation table and actually uh, agreeing on something practical and tenable might be very, very tricky. So the situation is evolving. Some of, uh, some of this, these concepts and more about technological aspects are also covered in my book. So if you are uh, interested in more, uh, more uh, concepts and thinking of the kind, uh, feel free to get familiarized. And again, thank you very much for your attention.